six, nine, four, nine, three, two. Are people surprised that you've written a book, that you've written your autobiography? Uh, I don't know. I never asked them that question. Maybe they are, or maybe they don't even care. Well, now, for people who haven't read the book, tell us a little bit about it. What's in it? What are people going to discover about Frank Zappa? Well, that he was willing to meet him halfway by making the type really large and putting in cartoons. Yeah, but there's more to it than that. Well, the front part of the book is that kind of stuff that you would expect, you know, my childhood, the gas mask, all that kind of stuff. And the second half is about little essays about things that uh, I'm concerned about. Did you enjoy writing the book? Was it fun for you kind of going back over the years in your mind? No, that part wasn't fun. The part that was fun was writing the stuff at the back of the book. The stuff that's more current? Yeah. You've been in the music business for, what, 25 years? You've been making music for at least that long, yet you were never really in the mainstream. Did you ever want to be? Well, I always thought that I was entitled to be because I believe that what I do would amuse and entertain a larger number of people. But the problem is getting my product to market. And you know, because we were discussing this before we went on the air, you're talking about a very corrupt business. And your question to me was, why hasn't anybody managed to tell the story of how the charts work and how the record business is corrupt and about the payola? And you told me that people had tried to do this story. And you know what I said? Because there's more payola. Every time they try and do the story, somebody either cuts it off or buys it off. Now you ask me why I'm not more mainstream, because they say things like that and they're true. Is it true that you really are giving up the music business? I have given up the struggle to get a record on the radio. I'll continue to write music, no question about it. But the problem that I have is, first of all, in order for somebody to know that I am musically alive, they have to hear what I do broadcast someplace. They simply never hear it. And then you have to be able to get it into a record store. Well, there's only, only so much real estate in a record store. And if a guy has racks, he wants to fill them with hit records. So sometimes it's hard to even get the music into the store. That's why I have a mail order company. You want to get the records? Call 818 Pumpkin and order them by mail if, you, if they're not in the store. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a way of doing alternative merchandising for what I do. And it, I do an album and I go, well, should I try and take anything off of this album, make a single, and put it on the radio? And, and the answer, at last, finally, clear, before my very eyes is, no, forget about it. Hmm. If you're not going to be doing music, you know, full time, what will replace it? What are you doing now? I have um, some, let's call it international trade um, projects going on with the Soviet Union. Do your records get played in the Soviet Union? No, but they will be sold in the Soviet Union because I made a deal for three of the albums to be released there. Broadway the Hard Way, Guitar, and uh, Jazz from Hell. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the work that you're doing is not music business, it's, it's what, international... Well, here's an example. There's a guy who has a muffin company in the United States. He wants to sell muffins in Russia, and so I went to Russia and talked to some people about helping him sell muffins. And then I meet a man in Russia who has uh, a screenplay, and he's looking for somebody in the United States to um, work on the screenplay. Here's the example. Through an interpreter, he's telling me, I have this story. It's a true story. Once upon a time, the U.S. ambassador was arrested and sent to a concentration camp in Siberia. Now, we don't want money. We only want an American actor willing to spend three months in Siberia. Can you help me? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> Came back to Hollywood, went to a party, accidentally ran into Chris Christopherson. I told him, you know, Chris, this man, he, he wants somebody to go to Siberia. Chris says, I'll do it. So I don't know whether they'll ever work it out, but that's the kind of things that I'm doing. Huh. Let me ask you a couple of things that I've heard. I don't know if they're true or not, but they might be fun just to talk about. Is it true that you don't drive a car and haven't driven in 20 years? Uh, my license expired in 1967, <clears throat> and I have not driven a car, nor will I ever stand in line again at the Department of Motor Vehicles in Southern California, one of the most debasing experiences that a human being can participate in. So you just don't drive because of the lines? It's, no, it's not just the lines. I mean, there are lines everywhere. But when you're moved from place to place and grilled by people with an intelligence factor somewhere near 
pick the best raisin in a box of raisin bran. Okay, that's about what's going on there. And then to spend four hours out of your life talking with these people going from place to place, I never want to do it again. Besides, I don't go anywhere. I stay home. So I made my wife get a license. She had never driven before, and now she, she does all of it. In the book, I'm with the band, you uh, play a fairly large role. Has anybody talked to you about playing yourself in the movie version? No, I have no interest in doing that. Uh -huh. Okay. What's a typical day around the Zappa household? I, I can't imagine you somehow going to McDonald's or, or a Little League game. Well, I have been to Little League games, but always under duress because I have absolutely no interest in baseball. But then again, if your son's playing, that's a little special, so you go. Mm -hmm. uh, I do go to McDonald's every once in a while. Usually what I'll do is I'm working in the studio and I know somebody who's going to McDonald's and they'll bring it back to me. Father's Day is coming up. What do you think would be the perfect Father's Day gift? A uh, new recording console for my studio. Hmm. And how do you think your kids would describe Frank Zappa, their dad? Well, Dweezil has already done it in one interview. He said, I was the coolest dad in the world. And that's a really big compliment coming from a guy who is the coolest guitar player in the world. Hmm. Any of, what about Moon Unit? What would she say? I think she might have some reservations. You know, uh, she introduced me at a dinner the other day as like, you can imagine what it would be like living with this man all these years, the way he <laughs> ignores women. And yet you've been married to the same woman for, for all your life. No, I, this is my second wife, but I've been with this one for 21 years. Fifty years from now, how would you like to be remembered? It won't make any difference. How do you think people will remember you? I don't think they'll be able to remember because a drug problem will have gotten so bad by then, they won't, they won't be able to remember anything. <laughs> On that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to go, but thank you very much, Frank. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Okay, Kip. Bye. Bye. Oh, I could have gone on forever.